What will 2011 hold for Hampton Roads? Tonight, our roundtable gazes into its crystal ball on everything from business to politics. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. As we near the end of the year, it's a good time to look back and to look ahead as well. So we've invited some of our old friends and a new one to do just that. Our new guest is Bill Crescenzo. He covers banking and finance as well as the maritime industry with Inside Business Magazine. Uh, Don Lozado returns from the editorial page of the Virginian Pilot. To help us look ahead to the General Assembly, we're glad to have Christina Knuckles with us. And because we love to think through what it all means through the long lens of history and the discipline of political science, we're glad to have Dr. Quentin Kidd back with us. He is, of course, a political science professor at Christopher Newport University. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. Good to be here. I feel we, we are lucky to have gotten you as we end out the year, so I'm glad to have you with us today. Bill, welcome to our panel. Thank you. Thank you for being. You are from the southern end of New York City. Clearly. I am Queens, yeah. <laughs> Middle Carolina. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's good to have you with us. You've only been here six months, so we will not hold you responsible for the past of Hampton Roads. How about that? <laughs> Looking ahead, though, as you think about the economy uh, in the in the new year, what does the business outlook look like for Hampton? Well, the economists uh, who I've spoken to, uh, stagnant slow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the optimism that you might have seen a couple of years ago, I think there's a lot of resignation now that 2011 and 2012, it's going to be uh, very dicey yeah. and uh, very little growth in uh, employment and retail. Uh, it's Again, just going to sure. say stagnant, the economists I've spoken to. The, the implications of the Joint Forces Command closure, we now know a little bit more about that, what the outcome of that may be. And what, how do you see that shaking out in 11? Well, of course, you know, the military is obviously the largest employer, mm -hmm. one of the largest employers. And, uh, uh, you know, again, it's a wait and see type of deal. But it and looks like some of those assets are going to, the, the supporting industries are going to remain. Right. At least it's sounding like the command structure is sort of going to get dis, uh, dispersed into some other areas, but a lot of those assets may remain. Yes, that's true. That's true. So we'll hope that that's the case. Yeah. Don Lozado, good to have you back with us good today. To uh, Joint Forces Command was the big bombshell that mm -hmm. was dropped a couple of months back. Right. I, I don't think anybody was really. I mean, there was a day or so ahead of time that. Uh, well, I think. I, I mean, I think most of the elected officials that we talked to were yeah. surprised by it and and sort of violently surprised to it, but, yeah. by it because it was such an enormous shock. Um, I think that while some assets are probably going to stay, it's 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 going to be a big blow economically. I was going to ask you how much in your financial forecasts and in your economic forecasts, DIFCOM was a factor in that sort of in the gloom and doom in the of gloom 2011. And doom. The, huh? the, uh, I can't speak to that. I, I cannot speak to that. The uh, economists I spoke with, uh, they looked at. Again, unemployment, retail, right. and uh, I'm not sure how much they factor that in. And well, I think some of that is such a wait and see thing too. Yeah. Yeah. True, but Jim yeah. Cook has made some pretty, pretty rough projections for what GIFCOM's closure would mean for this community. Jim Cook, the former president of Old Dominion, right. does the State of the Region. He does the report. State of the Region, and I, I think when he did the State of the Region, he said something on the order of 10,000 jobs and about a billion dollars out of the local economy, which is. Enormous. As much as, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's a huge, huge hit. It seems like what we don't know is how long it takes them to right. completely dismantle GIFCOM, where the supporting uh, operations go, how many people remain with those supporting operations, right. how much is really shut down. Sure. And, you know, with, with the military, um, as with the federal government generally, when things shut down, they normally take several years to do so. Right. So the impact of it might actually be reduced somewhat mm. uh, or spread out over time. You know, speaking of that, I remember when they announced in 2005 that Fort Monroe was on the BRAC list, mm -hmm. and they said, oh, well, it'll be closing in 2011. Oh, my goodness. That felt like forever right. and a day away, and here <laughs> it is, right around the corner. We're at forever, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it's going to close, and what it's going to look like after it closes is still an open question. I mean, I think um, most of the folks, most of the preservation folks, and our page included, would like to see National Park Service take an enormous role here. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's it's a, an incredibly rich historically um, uh, site in Virginia and for a variety of reasons not not just because of the Civil War and I think it really needs to be preserved or at least that history needs yeah. to be preserved and interpreted 
You know, it's interesting, too, to look at the plans uh, back in 2005 that right. were beginning to take shape and what is now beginning to take shape, which is that the National Park Service will have some interest in it, certainly yeah. in the historic moat area, and there's a debate about whether they might want to take a more active or a more expanded interest in it. But, you know, I don't think you can talk about Fort Monroe without talking about uh, the citizen movement that really shaped in many respects, I think, where we are today. Oh, I think that's true. I mean, I think it had this just gone along as it was, as it began, I think we would have ended up with condos mm -hmm. all over. Um, I think that's not likely to happen. I don't think the development on Fort Monroe is going to be anything like what might have happened initially had there not been a reaction. So I think that's a testament mm -hmm. to the power of, you know, citizen involvement. Well, uh, citizen involvement is something that we've been engaged in around transportation for some time, at least in the form of people sitting behind their wheels in rush hour, yes. uh, being so angry right. about the traffic, and there just does not seem to be much of an end to this. Uh, Christina Knuckles, uh, Governor McDonald came into office talking about transportation. Not really much has happened, or, or are we wrong about not that? Not much has happened. He hasn't had any success so far in passing an ABC privatization plan, which was going to deliver a small amount of money but it was real new money if it had happened but he's uh, trying to come up with a plan B legislators are not very patient with that right now offshore drilling is uh, postponed for seven years mm -hmm. so he doesn't have the ability to make those promises right now he's simply talking about uh, bonds debt scraping together uh, money that's sitting too long and spending that but he doesn't have a very uh, coherent long-term plan right now and he's still struggling to find some Thing. Is the liquor store privatization dead, dead, dead? Um, he's trying to come up with a second proposal, but patience w with the le among the legislators is really ebbing, and there's a potential that they'll put that into a study. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we still have to see because he hasn't announced the specifics of a new proposal. But legislators don't want to deal with that this year. They're worried about two things. What's my district going to look like, and am I going to get elected yeah. in November? And Everybody's then, up in the fall. Exactly. And, and redistricting, of course, will, will take shape as well. That's right. What do you see with redistricting? What, what, what do you anticipate? It's going to be ugly. We have an interesting situation that the House is controlled by Republicans and the Senate by Democrats, and that hasn't happened before. So I think that we will see even more that it is about incumbent protection. Uh -huh. um, in order to kind of have a truce between the two parties, everybody gets to take care of their own people, and let's not rock the boat. So but isn't, uh, isn't there a piece of it that's related to how many people the census tells you are in certain districts and that's how right. there may be some districts law? Lost and some some gained, I suppose. I don't. That's exactly right. Yeah. You have to uh, equalize the population within certain parameters. But there's still with computers, you can still do uh, make a lot of mischief yeah. within those parameters. Which is how you get some very interesting shapes. That's you know, exactly I think right. with redistricting, the real story. It's going it, to all of that complication. What really complicates it even more is that over 10 years, there's been a pretty dramatic population shift out of Southwest and Southside Virginia to Eastern and Northeastern Virginia, and so you've got situations where. Your, uh, parts, of, parts of the state are literally going to lose districts, lose seats, and those seats are going to be moved to other parts of the state while parties are trying to protect their incumbents. And so I think it's going to be really complicated, interesting to watch from my perspective, but really sure. complicated. And yeah. it's not just strictly in the rural areas. Um, there's been a uh, population, uh, the way the, the, the districts are drawn in Southampton Roads, mm -hmm. Yvonne Miller, Mamie Locke, Ralph Northam, Frank Wagner, uh, Jeff McWaters, all of those districts are down 10 and 20,000 voters. And because they're all in a row, somebody's going to lose out in that process. You think we will lose one of those seats? It's a possibility. It'll be, have to be very creative uh, district drawing, and I'm not sure because there are two, a couple of Republican districts. And those are in senators, there, yeah. yeah. So, that yeah. the Democrats are necessarily going to try to save both of them. And what's, ha and what's happened is it's not that Hampton Roads has lost population; it simply hasn't grown at the rate um, of Northern Virginia, sure. but also uh, suburban Richmond as well. And so. Uh, so we're sort of struggling to preserve what we have in the context of population shifting within Hampton Roads, but also other parts of the state growing faster than we are. So speaking of Hampton Roads versus Northern Virginia, that's what we have coming up in this showdown around transportation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's not really a showdown. Let's face it. Yeah. I think Northern Virginia has <laughs> won yeah. the day and walked yeah, away, yeah. kicked yeah. sand in our face, yeah. and that's where yeah. that's where it is. Um, Northern Virginia is going to have a banner year for transportation next year. They're getting hot lanes and all kinds of new transportation, uh, which will hopefully help relieve congestion there. 
Uh, Quentin Kidd, you were you were saying you really think that there's been some interesting developments here that are influencing. Yeah, you know, for for a couple of years now, and for a couple of years in the future, the Commonwealth Transportation Board is allocating most of the federal money to Northern Virginia. Hampton Roads, I think this year has none. I don't think they're going to have any next year. And you know, they're building big projects up up there: the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, the the Mixing Bowl, expanding the Fairfax County Parkway, widening that, um, and extending it. And and a lot of this is being supported by federal money. And and the reason that federal money has gone up there and not here is that Northern Virginia had their act together. They knew what they wanted. They worked as a as a cohesive region to get what they wanted, while we were dilly dallying around down here. And now we're in a situation where we're talking about all these projects with tolls attached to them. Right. And the, and the real downside to that is once you build a funding model that's dependent upon tolls. If we expand the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel and it's a tolling project. The toll is never going to go away, and there's no incentive for the Commonwealth Transportation Board to allocate federal money here to take the tolls away. And so we're, I think and what I worry about is we're in a situation where Northern Virginia is building the projects they need with federal money, and we're going to build the projects we need with tolls. And we're going to lock so the in idea place. Is if, if we put too many tolls in place, then uh, the the money people are going to say, "Well, they they can do it with tolls. Why they do well, they for it?" it the region's paid for their projects, and it becomes it? worse because if you build roads without tolls, then you unify a region. If you build roads only with tolls, you separate a region. You atomize it. It becomes the Elizabeth River becomes you know five six dollars to get go across and get back. I mean, it becomes a barrier. The James River the same way. So it separates us into these little mm -hmm. communities instead of cohering us into. A region. You know, that's a great point because, you know, it would, I, I suspect, <coughs> influence your travel plans and Absolutely. your patterns uh, when you factor all of that in, not only just time of day, but whether you're just really genuinely interested in right. going to another place if you had to factor all of that in. Well, why don't we have a light rail that would connect? You have only been here six city. months, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, uh, I like talking about the light rail. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but light rail is an interest. And will we see movement on that in 2011? The starter line is supposed to be finished in, in May, May. In May. And the, at the beach, the mayor had said, we'll put it to a referendum. What's, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I, what I hear, and uh, I, a disclaimer, the, the uh, light rail goes right by my house. But uh, <laughs> uh, I hear a lot of people saying, where is it going to go? Yeah. Or, you and know, Newtown where, Road is not what yeah, they have in where, as, as Dr. Cook said, I believe, nobody goes to lunch on Newtown Road. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, what, 7.4 miles, I right. believe. And uh, So people are, what I'm hearing is, who's going to ride it? And, and where are they going to take it to? And, but but uh, is that, I mean, is that really f fair in this respect? It seems to me that when they started light rail, they always said this was a starter line. Right. The intention sure. was, you know what I mean, the, the intention was to take it to the oceanfront. The intention was uh, to take it up to the naval base and beyond. And so this is really in Virginia Beach's court now, isn't it? Because it seems to me that if Virginia Beach doesn't get on board with this, pardon that pun, there's so many places you can go on puns with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but if Virginia Beach doesn't get on board, then we do have a light rail to Newtown Road. Well, the ball has been going back and forth for for years, from yeah. what I understand, is that is that right? My, my sense is Virginia Beach is going to get on board. I mean, if you just look at the election results, I mean, the the, the people who are running against it didn't win. The people who are for it won. The mayor, uh, uh, you know, the mayor's for it, and my my sense is. Um, that there's an excitement about light rail, that there's sort of an intrigue about it. Yeah. And I think part of that is that we've been so frustrated over transportation for so yeah. long in this region yeah. that anything that looks like it's making progress, anything people are like slightly si right. excited about it. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, people look at the line and say, the, the starter line, and say, it doesn't seem to go anywhere and it doesn't seem yeah. to start anywhere. But they're really fascinated by the idea that, that it's going to go all over. Eventually. Eventually. Well, but you could have made that argument about you know, the metro when it first opened. Yeah. I mean, it takes a while for the development to crowd the yeah. stops, yeah. you know, the transit-oriented development. And I think it's important to remember that metro was not popular. Yeah. It, when, when they, when they, was when it, it was really built, not? it was not oh. popular. But there's yeah. an ego factor in Hampton Roads. Virginia Beaches used to be in the big dog in the mm -hmm. region, and, you know, now all the excitement is with a project in Norfolk, and they're right. getting ahead of us. And I don't think they want to be left <laughs> out of that for very long. So you long. think that, so if you were betting today, not that we are, because because riverboat gambling has not been approved. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, if we were betting today, you'd say Virginia Beach will approve it. Yeah? I, I think so. All right. So the other thing I'm hearing in terms of transportation, this is a, a sort of a sort of back chatter, is the idea that since there is very little public money, if any, we are rapidly coming to a time where we talk about these public-private partnerships when really what we're going to have 
is private private partnerships and the implications of that uh, just in terms of making this region a very very different place I don't know whether you can have truly private projects because it would just be so brutally expensive and we wouldn't you know it cost me twenty dollars to get to and from work I mean it's but do you I have a sense that people are paying attention to this I, I don't I hope so because have that sense. I mean <laughs> We write about it enough, and I think yeah. lots of people talk about it because the implications are that you end up not, you know, not being able to get where you need to go unless you can bring your banker in the back seat. Yeah, you know right. I mean? yeah. And so, here's my big question: Do we think that 2011 will be the year that we finally have a contract for the Midtown Tunnel? What do you think? Mm -hmm. They've talked this project to death. I just think, you know, at some point Skanska has to say, "We're not talking anymore." <laughs> you know, let's yeah. just move on this. Yeah. And you know, this is one project. And yes, the tolls would be high, and people would freak out. It's one of the few projects where you even have the theoretical possibility that it could be totally on tolls because right. it's pretty small and concentrated. Right. If they want to buy that down fine, they're going to have to take money from somebody to do it. Because right but now it's what, in the two range, 217, yeah, 218? That, but I think $2. that's with state money involved, um, buying it down to a certain degree. I think they're trying to buy it down to $1.50 <laughs> right. right. over two yeah. right yeah. now. So the state's got to come up with something. Right. In but there. if they can get that one project, <laughs> I think that there will be then the ability to build on that. That with some of these more complicated projects, but this is a small one, and it should be. They should have decided. By so now. what is? I mean, what is going on with? Uh, what is going on? It's hard to understand because now it's 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 transferred across two secretaries of transportation. And I remember the last secretary said, "Look, if you people can't get the midtown done, I got nothing for you." Right. Yeah. Uh, you're, you, well, all of these legislators who talked about public-private partnerships but never used the word toll. Now they can't get away from the fact that it is a toll and that that is a tax and people don't want that. And so it was easy to say I'm against any kind of tax increase, but now they have to go to their constituents and say you're going to have to pay two dollars mm -hmm. or whatever to go through this tunnel. And so we've gotten squeamish about this now. Do you think it's partially that they don't they don't have the money to buy down the toll sufficiently so it will be frictionless it, so it won't be a barrier? Right. Uh, um, There's a hurt point in the tolls right. and they can't get below that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, VDOT doesn't have any money. We're um, moving $500 million from construction to the maintenance fund in a year. And so they just don't, there's no money lying around to um, be able to invest a little extra public funds in order to buy the tolls down. You know, it's an interesting point, though, because there is a pot of money there that one supposes that VDOT would be spending. You could spend it on interstates, you could spend it on secondary roads, you could spend it on primary roads and a combination thereof. Uh, one of the arguments I heard positive recently, which is a really interesting one, is maybe VDOT says, look, people, if, if, if we want this, you know, if this is how much we have, we can certainly live within our means. It means that none of the secondary roads will be repaired for a while. And if you're okay with that, you know, yeah. then we can put the money into the primaries, and the, I'm not sure people are ready for that, though. No, I mean, because you're going to. I, mean, I think up, conceptually, if it's your street yeah. that doesn't get repaired, right. I'm okay with that. Well, I mean, you can see how people have reacted to not having their grass cut right, in right, some right, of the right, cities, right, you right. know, because the public grass hasn't been cut in weeks or months. It's in some. In some of the real pressure points when it comes to transportation, the real eye catchers, the headline grabbers, are the HRBT and the Midtown right. Tunnel. Some of the real pressure points that frustrate people to death are those secondary roads. Yeah. Yeah. Union Boulevard, Highway 17. And that, your research showed that. That's, that's exactly really right. where people right. Yeah, are, when you ask yeah. people, all right, tell us where you deal with transportation, where you deal with these uh, traffic backups. Um, they'll tell you, you know, a block from my neighborhood or a half a mile from my neighborhood when I get to the main street, I have to sit through three or four light cycles. So I think that would frustrate people really quickly hmm. if you well, were Well, they don't have to go through the downtown tunnel or the midtown tunnel, clearly, because that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's been an unintended consequence of the policy decision that was made to start moving construction dollars to maintenance. It makes sense that you have to take care of what you've got before you can build new, but it has actually made it difficult to reach consensus because the rural legislators don't have a problem. Right, right. And so the pain is concentrated in Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia, and the rest of the state doesn't feel any motivation mm. to help out. And if that decision had not been made, then everyone would be suffering potholes and et cetera. And so there might now be a little bit more of a desire across the board to, to act.
You know, Christine, I wonder, and, and boy, you know, we should all be sort of savoring this moment where we don't have political ads on the air because it will not last. <laughs> Big year coming up, right? right. Uh, everybody's up for, for re-election uh, in, in the House and Senate. I'm wondering, uh, what do you see happening in terms of power for this region? I mean, we've talked for a little while now about the fact that uh, we have a pretty young, comparatively speaking, legislative delegation. Uh, Hampton Roads is in a rebuilding um, uh, period right now, and that tends to exacerbate the problems uh, with the fact that Hampton Roads, to some extent, is two regions that fight among themselves, and therefore they don't get much accomplished because they spend up spend they spend all their time kind of uh, fighting among themselves, staring at their belly buttons, and Northern Virginia more united, more bipartisan efforts that in that direction they can can walk away. And nevertheless, Northern the Virginia doesn't have a majority of votes in the House mm. or the Senate, mm -hmm. so they need us. Mm. They need us to get along, <laughs> and that's very difficult. Then other regions view Hampton Roads as a challenging partner because really? of that. Yes. Huh, that's interesting because one of the things that had been a, a great hope a year or so ago was that there were these uh, sort of initial conversations between the Hampton Roads delegation and the Northern uh -huh. Virginia delegation, and the thinking was that that would be a tremendous opportunity, that more in yeah. it for us than for them. I always get the sense that. The legislators around the state think of Hampton Roads like you think of that, you know, that strange set of cousins <laughs> that are just a little, you know, you, you, you see them during family holidays and they're just yeah. slightly off and you yeah. can't yeah. quite <laughs> put your finger on it. And, it's, and, it, and I think Christina's hit, hit it right on nail on the head. It's, it, we, we're really two regions and in some senses two regions and one of those regions is further subdivided. Norfolk and Virginia uh -huh. Beach always struggling with each other and we just can't get our act together. And, and figure out now, what we're Now, if I had legislators say. sitting here, what they would say is we are more together than we ever have been. We're meeting, uh, you know, occasionally outside the session <laughs> and we have meetings in the session. I would just say that's a testament to how bad it really ha has been. Is, if that's your standard for, for saying this is our progress, then so, my goodness. So compare that for us. What does it look like in Northern Virginia compared to what it looks like here? Well, I think there's consensus in Northern Virginia around the, the big right. picture items, right. what's needed in the big picture sense. They're going to squabble about their own parochial interests and needs. But do we need a mixing bowl project and should we all come together? It doesn't matter if you live in McLean or you know, Loudoun County, you agree that that's needed. Uh, that's just not the case here, no. mm -hmm. and no. that's our big problem. And, yeah. and if I can say, uh, when I talk with people outside of the area and I say I live in Hampton Roads, they say, where is Hampton Roads? They know Norfolk, yeah. they know Virginia Beach, but they don't know Hampton Roads as a region. So how do you define that when they say, where is Hampton Roads? Well, I South say, of yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell them it's Norfolk, Virginia, yeah. uh -huh. Suffolk. Yeah. You know, I mean, I explained that sure. you know the, it's, it's a big region, but but they they've just they've never heard of Hampton Roads before. Maybe it's you know their ignorance. I don't know, but uh, but as far as we're talking regionalism, yeah. and and I think that really is kind of a testament to uh, the fact that as you all say that we're known as two regions. Yeah. And, and see, yeah. that's so interesting because that's the same conversation we had 20 years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, this is not a new no. conversation. No, so, this is an old conversation. Uh, so welcome to our world. <laughs> to be, yeah. Welcome to Hampton Roads that's or right. Tidewater <laughs> or Norfolk or Virginia <laughs> Beach or, <laughs> or whatever you yeah. want to go. Start taking the medication, you'll understand. <laughs> <also>. <laughs> we have just about one minute left and I, I, I can't let us uh, get Christina Knuckles out of here without talking about uh, the Attorney General who's had a very, very active year. Yes, uh, Ken Cuccinelli has the world by t the tail right now. Everybody is waiting to see what he wants to do next. He's suing the federal government and in a legal battle with UVA. Uh, he's managed to keep in the headlines as much or more than the governor. And uh, no one knows yet. I, he keeps his own counsel, so no one knows is he going to run for the Senate? Is he going to run for governor? Is he going to stay as attorney general? Uh, he has lots of options, and he has a very strong following in the party. I think I think he uh, can uh, pretty much take on any Nationally? adventure he wants. Possibly. His name, uh, he's actually got a lot of name recognition across the U.S. Well, we'll have to leave it there, but I'll be glad to get you all back in the new year. And, to, and, to, and I, we're recording all of this, so we'll come back at the end of next year and find out how right y'all were. <laughs> Happy holidays and thanks for being here. We'll be back in a moment with a little uh, fun moment to end with.
Have you seen one yet? They're taking the country by storm and by surprise. They're called flash mobs. Moments where, seemingly out of nowhere, performers show up. They secretly agree to meet and go about their business in a certain location. And then, without warning, but at a clearly appointed hour, they just burst into song. Here's what it looked like in a crowded store in Philadelphia recently. We are told the diners at the Why Not Pizza on Collie Avenue in Norfolk got a little performance with their pepperoni last weekend, thanks to the flash mob. Word on the street is if you're hanging out around Fairgrounds Coffee House, just let's say, you may get more excitement than you might expect from your double espresso. I cannot confirm or deny, I'm just saying, Saturday, 1 o'clock, near Fairgrounds in the Collie Discount Pharmacy, Collie Avenue, Norfolk. If you'd like to watch tonight's show again or any of our past broadcasts, it's so easy to do. Just visit our website, whatmatters.tv, and there you'll also find lots of ways to be in touch with us. Drop us an email or join us on Facebook, and you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter, and we'll be glad to let you know about the programs we have in the works for you. If you're on your radio dial, I hope you'll join us each weekday, noon to 1, for our little talk radio program on 89.5 WHRV. Thanks for watching tonight. I'm Kathy Lewis. We'll see you again for another look at What Matters.